the two first things we we needed to decide on in the making of that film was where would he live and how would she look um and i think right the way through it's we decided it was it, it is a film of duplicity in that um, both the audience and caleb who is going to be testing out this piece of machinery has to be confused at times and forget whether it is a uh, a robot or a human and it depends in what your state of mind is and his as well by the drama but where you've come from and where you're about to go to whether oh my god he's falling in love or he's yeah. relating or having some empathy with this machine and that's what AI, that's what perhaps ai is going to move to and that's what he's testing hello hi i've never met anyone new before have you None like you. So I, I think right from the beginning, we, we wanted a softness. We needed both a softness and a hardness. So we needed two forms of material. And I think we also wanted it to feel that technology would allow us to move forward. We, technology has always been hard-edged and highly mechanical. And I think we wanted to marry that mechanics with fluid and softness. And in fact, that's what we have in our human structure. Yeah. She's incredible. The challenge is to show you that she's a robot and then see if you still feel she has consciousness. Her brain, we looked at, at um, jellyfish and how they live and how they are, you know, a changing and a floating um, organism. Um, we, we, we looked at, and then we said, how do we show both? So you need a transparency. But within that transparency, at several levels, from the outer shell, through the fluid, back into the mechanics you go between the two so you know perhaps it is that we are this thing is half organic and half um mechanical and and also it was also much of her look is driven about how pragmatically we could afford visual effects right through the film it was a small film we couldn't just yeah. say we could have visual effects right the way through so he said okay we want to concentrate our, our visual effects on the most important thing here which is how this android looks and how they behave. Basically, a lot of the shots are uh, what we say bus type, from, from head down to chest. And um, we have definitive lines in the design of her costume and her, her outer material that allow them to easily cut in with visual effects because that's where all the money is spent when you, yeah. merge, uh, when you merge the two materials. So how does a programmer get to be meeting the CEO? I won a competition. The president can't get Mr. Garrick on the phone. You got the golden ticket. How was like finding the house that uh, has the, the heart that you needed for the movie? The original script actually read that it was a house, uh, a billionaire's house in Colorado, perhaps a giant wood cabin or wood based uh, mansion. Um, and along with that, we also thought you naturally think um, a tech billionaire, they will have uh, a modernist. Californian style uh, building or Corbusier uh, type style of, of, of modernity. Um, so we did think of that. Of course, we always try to throw that out. We try to throw out the language that we are fed in society and the cliches and what we immediately think and start from the beginning. But nevertheless, we went down a bit of that journey. And in truth, it was hard to find a location that we could get into that was a billionaire's location that fulfilled that brief. We could get, and we looked all over. We went to Europe, we went to Madrid. You know, we, we looked across, well, there's some fantastic um, buildings in Argentina and Chile and South America, but we could never get permission to film in there or even use it. Um, we could get into a few millionaires' houses, but they felt like millionaires' houses. So we said, okay, let's start again. What is the intrinsic, or the, again, going back to being simple, what is the simple things that tell us someone is very uh, rich um, and very discerning. And it is that they are, in, they are remote and they're, they're often encased in nature. You, you, only the very rich can buy themselves into secure and remote nature. And we also, a lot on this show, we tip things around and flipped it around so he doesn't have to have a big house. Or where he, where he is doing this thing, he probably has got hundreds of houses all over the globe. But he's focused himself on this project. All he needs are, are, in a sense, the home comforts. 
So the space doesn't have to be large, but because of the type of person it is, it will it could be discerning and it could have an aesthetic, but it will be simple because all he cares about is his project. It's concrete, and that allows for our brutal modernity. Um, and it's concrete again to protect itself from outside interference. We also we did want something that was modern and had modernity to it. A lot of those buildings are actually museums, and um, they are places that might be glacial museums. So we, we looked at lots of sites on mountains. Maybe you had a small house on a mountain or bored into a hole or by a lake. Um, and then we, we found some glacial museums in and around Scandinavia. We then also noticed this other um, really interesting building on the side of, a, side of the hillside. Um, basically, we stopped there. We went to see this guy. Um, and this is the interior. So this is the place that gives us the front room and actually has it's built onto the side of a mountain so that mountain that rock comes into the front room that was already there for us but again it was too small but he said coincidentally oh the guy that designed this designed this hotel complex just down the road so we went there and the architecture is exactly the same i.e the um patination on the concrete walls the blocks were the same because it was the same designer the same architect so we had a marriage of two buildings they were half an hour apart um they were obviously similar and they fulfilled our brief and in truth we we already started building so where you don't see windows is a uh, set build where you can see outside um our locations we'd already started building um because we had to because of the schedule our interiors and um, where he does the dance where his bedroom is where the corridors are and they are actually curved because we did find a circular uh, building in Norway that we were going to use, in Sweden, in fact, that we were going to use. And then we threw that out because there were all sorts of, there were issues about being able to film there. But we'd already, we'd already planned the rest of our set on it, so we carried on with circular walls. And we decided that if it's subterranean, of course it could be circular, even though the upper buildings were a bit more um, rectangular. Good to meet you, Nathan. It's good to meet you too, Kel. Uh, it's a future that it can be around the corner. It's not a future in so many years. I think it was looking at um, technology of the time and seeing just a little bit further where we were. Um, and I think it was just a matter of seeing how far can we push that but still allow people to believe it. Because I think the integrity for both these pieces, the integrity of the science, uh, the integrity of um, our experience as humans and modern day humans was very important I think, again otherwise i think people just could perhaps throw it out and it wasn't really about the technology it's about i think it was about human emotions isn't it yes. it's about the brain it's about how we think it's about existential existentialism i think looking at the future or looking at science fiction is always very scary for designers because whatever you do can be out of date or wrong within minutes and it's not often about the exact technology yeah. whether it's space travel or not it's about the subtext of it <laughs>